The Mysteries of Bob Lazar's Story About UFOs and Area 51 In November 1989, a television series titled Eight Cover Story UFO The Best Evidence, hosted by George Knapp, stirred up the American and global media. It was the highest-rated special report ever aired in Las Vegas, covering secrets and truths about UFOs, extraterrestrial spacecraft, and a plethora of other information allegedly being concealed by the government, disclosed by a mysterious man named Dennis. Dennis claimed that the government possessed UFOs at a facility called S-4, part of Area 51 in Nevada. He requested anonymity and confidentiality for all related information. However, shortly thereafter, Dennis, or Bob Lazar, decided to fully come forward to the public with his true identity and serious allegations against the U.S. government. This unexpected disclosure was seen as a defensive move and a threat to the forces that had attempted to silence him after the 1989 broadcast gained worldwide fame. Bob stated that he was compelled to reveal information about Area 51 and S-4 because the government had threatened his life and his family. Additionally, in the 1989 hidden interview, he argued that the government's cover-up actions were a crime against the American people and the entire scientific community. Engaging with technologies beyond human comprehension may have imposed a moral burden on Bob and put him in danger. Up until now, 35 years since this story was first disclosed to the public, the details revealed about Military Area 51, Groom Lake, and the alleged extraterrestrial aircraft remain shrouded in mystery. No concrete evidence has been found to substantiate Bob's claims and stories. His security clearances and background files are empty, with only a few details uncovered by the media but lacking much persuasiveness. One notable incident involves Bob's supposed encounter with Edward Teller, the theoretical physicist known as the father of the hydrogen bomb. The event unfolded serendipitously in 1982, when Lazar installed a jet engine in his Honda, propelling it to speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Following this incident, he made headlines in the Los Alamos Monitor for his achievement inadvertently catching Edward Teller reading an article about himself. At the time, many areas in Nevada were used as nuclear testing sites, so Teller could have been present in the region. Years later, when Lazar was seeking employment, he contacted Teller and referenced their chance encounter at Los Alamos. Teller immediately introduced him to someone else for job inquiries. Lazar then received an invitation letter and attended interviews for a position involving advanced propulsion systems in a remote area. This detail demonstrated that his background and education were not ordinary. However, details about his personal life, education, and work experiences at Los Alamos, Caltech, and MIT all mysteriously fade from Bob's narrative. This inconsistency has posed significant challenges for those inclined to believe in his enigmatic story. However, uncovering those details only proves that Bob is an intelligent and highly educated individual. It does not prove whether he ever worked with spacecraft or encountered extraterrestrial beings. We cannot ascertain whether the gaps in his record are evidence of deceit and deception or if some larger force has wiped out all traces of Bob's existence to portray him as a liar before the public. Bob recounts being ousted from this secretive project because he led a group of friends into the desert near Area 51 to witness an important test flight. When discovered, the group attempted to flee before being apprehended by Lincoln County sheriffs and turned over to authorities. And these are the primary details of Bob's life and story that the media could exploit. At a time when news, images, and stories about Bob saturated the headlines, he faced a wave of criticism and debate whose effects still linger today. Half the world believes in the existence of an alien civilization that has visited humans, while the other half considers these details too trivial and fabricated to believe. 
we always believe in what we want to believe. Bob Lazar has bluntly stated that fabricating stories and becoming a liar would bring no benefit to his life whatsoever. Now, as everything gradually fades into the past, Bob appears quite annoyed when journalists occasionally try to resurrect his story to sensationalize it with new doubts and mysteries. He wants to live peacefully and steer clear of the troubles that UFOs once imprinted on his life. So what have we been revealed from the mysterious story told over 30 years ago? Are those completely worthless lies? In the documents released by the government, there is no mention of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, or studies on extraterrestrial beings at Area 51. However, researchers argue that these documents do not provide complete information, and certainly, there are thousands of other pages of documents about this location. Many still believe that unidentified flying objects have been present around a secret U.S. military base for over half a century. Many of us are always eager to look at an objective truth. Who are these mysterious visitors? Where do they come from? What are they doing here? What do they want from us? And could they pose a threat to human survival? These mysteries and concerns have long surrounded the issue of UFOs, and Bob is someone who has advanced significantly in that field. He has seen answers to questions humans have struggled with for a long time. Bob has been privy to the most visual documentation regarding extraterrestrial matters. 121 detailed briefing documents, including comprehensive instructions on spacecraft, the structure of bodies, and details about another world. This is too much for a scientist specializing in propulsion systems and energy systems across nine spacecraft existing at Area 51. The truth is he also played a role in reverse engineering, researching particularly propulsion systems and energy sources related to Element 115, if the information he provided is accurate. Lazar alleges that in the 1980s when he was in his 20s, he worked on UFO-related projects for the U.S. government at S-4, a facility purportedly located 15 miles south of Area 51. On Bob Lazar's first day at Area 51, he was inundated with a large amount of security paperwork, lasting two to three hours. He described it as a tedious process. Lazar recounted to Joe Rogan the moment he realized his job was far from ordinary. At a facility named S-4 nestled against the mountainside, he had a unique experience. Instead of the usual routine of entering through a regular door, where they arrived by bus and passed through double doors, Lazar noticed an expanded aircraft hangar door this time. Walking through the aircraft hangar, Lazar encountered a sight that left him stunned. A disc-shaped flying saucer, the very object he would be working on. Despite his initial skepticism, he noticed an American flag affixed to it, making him wonder whether it was just an advanced fighter jet or something else entirely. However, his skepticism vanished when he touched the machine and was immediately reprimanded by an armed guard. This encounter marked the first time Lazar realized he was involved in something out of the ordinary. Later, he met his laboratory partner, Barry, and they began working on some auxiliary parts of the craft. Witnessing the performance of the reactor amazed Lazar, realizing he was dealing with technology far beyond conventional understanding. This crucial moment solidified his belief that he was part of something truly extraordinary. It was a small reactor, about the size of a basketball, placed on a metal plate, and when activated, it generated its gravitational field, a phenomenon surpassing current human technology. This couldn't possibly be artificial technology. Normally, gravity comes from objects with large masses, not from machines. However, the reactor Lazar encountered challenged this understanding by creating its gravitational field. This revelation highlighted a significant difference between known scientific principles and the advanced technology Lazar encountered. The reactor's ability to generate gravity represents a fundamental breakthrough, challenging conventional scientific understanding. Barry, Lazar's laboratory partner, dared him to touch the sphere within the facility. However, 
Lazar found himself unable to do so as the sphere seemed to repel his hand, similar to the way two like poles of a magnet would. No matter how hard Bob tried, he couldn't push past that immense counterforce. Subsequently, as he delved deeper into his work, Bob endeavored to unravel the overarching mission of S4 and his specific role within the Area 51 facility. As each task was compartmentalized to the maximum extent for security purposes. Bob vaguely realized that the primary objective of the project was to reverse engineer alien spacecraft technology, aiming to reproduce it using materials available on Earth. To accomplish this ambitious mission, the project was divided into various components. Lazar's team focused on deciphering the power and propulsion systems of the craft, while other teams tackled different aspects such as metallurgy and the potential weapon capabilities of the craft. This approach ensured that no individual or group possessed complete knowledge of the project, thus maintaining its secrecy and security. When Joe Rogan inquired about how the spacecraft was activated, Bob Lazar provided a candid explanation of how the reactor operates. According to Lazar, there are several methods to initiate or deactivate the reactor. One method he learned from Barry involves removing a hemisphere from the reactor, revealing a small tower at the center. Placing the hemisphere back on the reactor will activate it. Lazar explained that the reactor operates on a gravity sensing mechanism. If there is no load on the reactor, it will automatically shut down. However, upon detecting a load, the reactor will initiate its startup sequence. What fascinated Lazar the most was the absence of conventional wiring connecting the auxiliary components of the alien device. Instead, these components only needed to be in proximity to each other for the system to function. He described this feature as borderline magic an advanced technology seemingly beyond comprehension. However, accompanying the excitement were risks that could be life-threatening. The energy and propulsion systems they were researching were unprecedented in human history. Thus, accidents occurred frequently as they endeavored to analyze and dissect the details for development and replacement. Although lacking detailed information about the incident, Lazar speculated that it might be related to an attempt to dissect one of the reactors, resulting in a fatal accident. Contrary to the majority, Lazar asserts that there were not just one, but nine different UFOs housed at the S-4 facility. However, he only directly interacted with one of these aircraft during his tenure. Lazar mentioned an occasion when all hangar doors between the aircraft hangars were fully open, allowing him to glimpse a variety of craft stored inside. Each aircraft had its distinct shape and characteristics, indicating their origins from elsewhere. Among them, Lazar observed one resembling a jagged rock and another resembling a flat disc akin to a straw hat. The significant dent in part of it suggested a high probability that it had been shot down. At that moment, Bob felt exhilarated to be at the forefront of scientific exploration, relishing every moment during his six-month stint at the facility. However, as he delved deeper into his work at the S-4 facility, he underwent a profound shift in perspective. He quickly became acutely aware of the inherent dangers involved. Lazar expressed increasing concern about the immense power that the devices they were researching possessed. Recognizing that they were dealing with astronomical forces capable of manipulating gravity and producing extraordinary effects instilled in him a sense of fear. He draws parallels with a hypothetical scenario of introducing a small, mobile nuclear reactor to scientists from the Victorian era. Despite initially being mesmerized by its capabilities, their lack of understanding of radiation would undoubtedly lead to disastrous consequences as they attempted to dissect the device. The inherent dangers posed by the advanced technology they were dealing with still needed to be understood. This is one of the reasons why Bob wants to disclose all information to the public, to alert everyone to the government's intentions. 
Bob Lazar continues to emphasize the inherent dangers associated with their experimentation with alien spacecraft. He warns that the lack of understanding of the physics underlying the technology, coupled with the incredible power levels involved, poses significant risks. In his view, they are like wolves trying to navigate the complexities of the technology while attempting to decipher its secrets. According to the summarized government report Bob received, the spacecraft they were attempting to study is said to be from the Zeta Reticuli star system. However, it's not just from the Zeta Reticuli system, but it is what they refer to as ZRURI. This is the third planet in that star system. However, he admits he couldn't verify this information accurately due to the limited details provided in the briefing, and all the details were printed on the same document referring to the reactor. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star, two stars orbiting around each other, and it can only be seen from the southern hemisphere and is about 30 light years away from us. Lazar and Rogan acknowledge that there may be some misinformation to prevent anyone among them from publicly or secretly leaking internal documents. Moving on to the propulsion system of the spacecraft, Bob Lazar asserts that it is fueled by the atomic element 115, an element he claims to be stable and capable of resisting decay. Notably, when Lazar first shared his story in the 1980s, the existence of Element 115 was not known to the public until 2016, when the scientific community officially acknowledged and announced Element 115 widely to the public under the name Moscovium. According to Lazar's initial disclosure, this element can generate gravitational waves, thus providing anti-gravity thrust for the spacecraft. More importantly, the reactor does not emit heat like plutonium-based test reactors. Today, scientists have proven the mysterious connection between element 115 and antimatter. Moscovium is highly stable, with 119 protons and 196 neutrons. The discovery and properties of element 115 were synthesized in 2003 by Russian scientists Dmitry Livovich Razinov and Amon Mehbe Patel Vaiv. Accordingly, the unique arrangement and distribution of energy levels of element 115 give it anti-gravity effects. According to quantum theory, element 115 has a special excited state, and the strong interaction between protons and neutrons is highly stable. This stability allows element 115 to create a peculiar gravitational field in space. If element 115 could be used to create an artificial gravitational field, we could achieve gravitational conditions in space, thereby reducing the physical burden on astronauts and improving their work efficiency as well as physical health. This technology is not only important for space stations and exploration missions, but can also be used to improve gravity simulation experiments and medical research on Earth. Furthermore, its properties suggest the potential to release a large amount of energy over an extended period. According to some experiments, element 115 would release a tremendous amount of energy upon collision which could help improve solar panels and nuclear energy technology, thus increasing energy utilization efficiency. If research in this field is successful, it will provide humanity with more sustainable and efficient energy solutions. However, to date, Research on Moscovium has not been comprehensive enough for humans to decide to apply it in daily life. Studies on Element 115 inevitably evoke memories of the assertions made by Bob Lazar from the previous century. How did he know about Element 115 when it had never been widely discovered on Earth? If the story about Area 51 is a lie, it is at least a well-intentioned lie because of the details we can prove to be true. Bob was allowed inside the UFO once. It was an experience he would probably never forget. Everything was covered in a dark pewter color, with no sharp corners, all curved together. There was hardly anything except for a small hatch that could fold down and look easily recognizable. The interior was designed for something about three feet tall. At the time they stepped in, there were no strange creatures there. Bob could only observe the seats the reactor, and some auxiliary parts. 
There were no control panels, no bathrooms, no decorative details or artwork. The reactor was in the center with three seats around it. The ship had three levels, with the reactor on the middle level. He wasn't sure if the ship was made of metal or ceramic, but it felt cold when touched. The entire ship had a diameter of about 54 feet. Based on the design and appearance of the spacecraft, Bob Lazar speculated that UFOs could be associated with ancient civilizations or even ancient extraterrestrials. He couldn't confirm whether the specific craft he was working on was related to archaeological excavations, but the mention of such a connection hinted at profound antiquity. This disclosure implied the possibility that these UFOs had existed for a long time, perhaps predating human civilization as we know it. In Bob's adventurous story, the presence of Russian scientists in the early stages of the project, which occurred near the end of the Cold War, was also very intriguing. Surprisingly, there was close cooperation between American and Russian scientists, including the exchange of ideas about nuclear weapons and electromagnetic pulse EMP, testing. This level of collaboration was unprecedented given the historical tensions between the two countries. However, after a significant discovery was made, the secrecy of the project increased, leading to the dismissal of Russian scientists from the base. But that seemed not to bother Bob. Evidence of this is his continued efforts to gain access to the flight test schedule and bring his friends to the area near Papoose Lake on three separate occasions to witness UFO activity. Using a VHS camera, they captured footage of a mysterious light in the sky that Lazar believed to be one of the aircraft he worked on at S-4. Unlike conventional aircraft or the saucer-shaped crafts depicted in movies, these aircraft flew belly first, performing rolling maneuvers to orient their bellies towards the target. On one occasion when Lazar witnessed a UFO flying, he noted that it took off from the ground silently and remained completely silent as it flew overhead. This silent and seamless takeoff further emphasized the unique nature of the aircraft's propulsion system. Interestingly, Lazar's description of the aircraft's flying capabilities closely resembles the testimony of U.S. Navy Commander David Fravor. In legal documents, Fravor recounted an encounter with a 40-foot-long white, tic-tac-shaped aircraft with no wings hovering over the Pacific Ocean in 2004. Along with Bob's descriptions, the testimony of the Navy commander is considered perfect supplementary evidence for the unique flying capabilities of these mysterious aircraft. Based on his story, Bob Lazar provided deeper insights into various programs conducted at S-4, affirming the existence of Project Galileo, Project Sidekick, and Project Look Glass. Project Galileo focused on various aspects of spacecraft technology, while Project Sidekick delved into potential weapon applications stemming from the capabilities of the craft. Everything he knew was recounted cautiously before the public. When asked if he would choose to walk down this path again if given the chance to turn back time, Lazar hesitated slightly. For any scientist, working at S-4 at the time was indeed fascinating, but the consequences it left behind are something not everyone can bear. After the incident leaked to the public, the FBI and many other security organizations monitored Bob and his family's actions. Whether the story is true or not, whether anyone believes it or not, it still changed the perception of many people worldwide about the existence of an advanced civilization beyond humanity. Certainly, at some point, Lazar also regretted his actions of disclosing internal information. In 1989, Lazar contacted investigative journalist George Knapp and told his story in May. Due to the obscured information, Knapp had to conduct several investigations over six months, and after partially substantiating the truth, he wanted to broadcast Bob's testimony on the local news in Las Vegas. He agreed that the world needed to know about this government secret. However, Bob then changed his decision and did not want to disclose his testimony, but it was too late. After the video was A-read, it quickly spread. Shortly thereafter, Bob's supervisor, 
Dennis Mariani, Khaled Lazar and three tinned him. The consequences of this were significant, with many of his relatives, friends and colleagues being monitored by the government. Bob also wished he had never publicly disclosed these truths. Taking a neutral stance, although the US military has concealed many issues surrounding Area 51, they have reasons to take these actions. The mysterious technologies from the strange aircraft could provide secretive and exclusive technologies related to weapon development and many other issues. Imagine if the gravity propulsion technology in Bob's story were applied to reality. Equipped with tanks, for example, then the history of warfare would open a completely new chapter. With such characteristics, everything would become impregnable. History might once again teeter as when J.R. Oppenheimer invented the nuclear bomb. That's when humanity touched upon truly destructive powers. The heat from Bob's story ignited the world's curiosity about Area 51 and all the areas surrounding it in Nevada. Approximately 193 kilometers northwest of Las Vegas, somewhere between mile markers 29 and 30, along the extraterrestrial highway in Nevada, State Route 375, there lies an unmarked dirt road. Though no buildings are visible from the paved road, this dirt path leads to Groom Lake or Homey Airport, as it's labeled on civilian aviation maps. For those in the know, this road leads to a military base with various unofficial names, Paradise Ranch, Watertown, Dreamland Resort, Red Square, The Box, Nevada Test and Training Range, Site 3, Air Force Flight Test Center, and Area 51. Every year, thousands of tourists from all over the world flock here in hopes of catching a glimpse of extraterrestrial spacecraft. Initially, the government sought to conceal the truth about this area due to its involvement in numerous military secrets and nuclear weapons testing. For decades, the U.S. government consistently denied the existence of this high-security military zone. Tight security, iron perimeter fences, occasional sightings of peculiar black aircraft. It wasn't until 2013 that the U.S. government officially acknowledged the existence of Area 51 when the CIA declassified documents regarding the development of the U-2 and A-12 aircraft. Today, Area 51 remains an active base, but its purpose has been a tightly held secret since the 1970s. One of the pieces of evidence that could shake up Bob's story is the revelations about aircraft testing. During that time, engineers at Area 51 were studying advanced aircraft acquired from foreign nations, not from outer space. However, with a flurry of high-tech flights at Area 51, including over 2,150 takeoffs of the A-12 aircraft, reports of unidentified flying objects soared in this area. These facts still require further verification. The A-12 is the highest flying aircraft in U.S. Air Force history, featuring twin jet engines, a long fuselage, and a resemblance to a stealthy snake. The supersonic A-12, manufactured by Lockheed Martin but disguised was dubbed Oxcart by its pilots. Clarence Kelly Johnson designed the A-12 at the CIA's request to replace the vulnerable U-2. Kept secret for about 40 years, the A-12 program was officially declassified in 2007. The first completed A-12 arrived at Area 51 in February 1962 after successful development in Burbank, only to be disassembled, transported to Area 51, and reassembled, costing the U.S. around 100,000 dollars in shipping expenses, about 0830 Gizorn in today's currency. For years afterward and up to the present day, High-altitude reconnaissance aircraft like the A-12 and numerous stealth aircraft such as the Bird of Prey, F-117A, and Tacit Blue have been developed and tested in the Nevada desert. Flights continue regularly despite public scrutiny. In September 2017, a U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel mysteriously died when his aircraft crashed in Nevada. The Pentagon has yet to disclose the cause or type of aircraft involved. It's highly probable that it was a foreign interceptor somehow acquired by the U.S. Despite all doubts, what cannot be denied 
is that Area 51 still plays a central role in the U.S. Air Force's clandestine projects, and whatever is happening there continues to pique the curiosity of the most inquisitive minds. Now, 30 years later, Lazar still asserts that his claims are true. The enigmatic man of the previous century participated in the documentary film Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers in 2018 with additional information to try to prove that he is telling the truth about the UFO claims since 1989. Just as he asserts, he has gained no benefits from this story whatsoever. All it has brought him is annoyance, danger, and trouble. After 35 years, everything Bob said remains intact as when he first appeared before the public in 1989. If this is a lie, then perhaps it is the greatest, grandest, and most consistent lie we have ever known and heard. Thank you for accompanying us until the last minute of this journey. If you're interested and find it useful, please subscribe and follow to await the latest videos from us. Goodbye, and see you in the next videos.